Hi everyone, let's do a short story called The Open Window and if you enjoy it, do consider subscribing. Let's begin. This story is called The Open Window and was written by Saki in the year 1914, a very long time ago. It is about a 15 year old girl called Vera who scares her new neighbor Frampton with her fanciful stories. Let's see what her stories are. My aunt will be down presently, Mr. Nuttle, said a very self-possessed young lady of 15. In the meantime, you must try and put up with me. So this young lady who is barely 15 years old is a very self-possessed girl. Self-possessed meaning calm, confident, composed, in control of her feelings. And she is talking to Mr. Nuttle because her aunt has not come downstairs yet. So she tells Mr. Nuttle, my aunt will be down soon, presently, soon. And in the meantime, please try and put up with me, bear with me. Frampton Nuttle endeavored to say the correct something which should duly flatter the niece of the moment without unduly discounting the aunt that was to come. The man's name was Frampton Nuttle. Endeavored means tried hard. So he tried hard to say the correct thing, which should duly flatter the niece of the moment. The niece of the moment? The niece, the young girl who was there with him at that moment. He wanted to flatter her. He wanted to praise her. Flatter means giving praise often insincerely. So he wanted to say something nice to her and flatter her without unduly discounting the aunt that was to come. Her aunt was going to come into the room shortly and he did not want to say something to the niece which might upset the aunt. He had to be careful to say something nice to the niece which would not upset the aunt in any way. Privately, that means in his mind, in his thoughts, he doubted more than ever whether these formal visits on a succession of total strangers would do much towards helping the nerve cure which he was supposed to be undergoing. In his mind, he had a lot of doubts about whether these formal visits were actually going to help him. His doctors had told him that he would be wise if he listened to them. He had a nerve problem. He was nervous. His nerves were bad. So the doctors had advised him to go into the countryside, like a village, away from the town, and rest over there. And not just keep to himself while he rested, but go around and meet people. And he was the kind of person who liked being alone. He did not like meeting people. So the doctors had told him that he had to make formal visits. He had to visit people whether he knew them or not. Whether they were his friends or not, he had to force himself and make formal visits on a succession. That means one by one, succeeding one another. And they were total strangers. So the doctors didn't care whether he was visiting total strangers. They said he just had to do it, whether they were strangers or not. So he was supposed to make a succession of total uh, visits to total strangers, and that was going to help his nerves. But he doubted it right now. I know how it will be, his sister had said, when he was preparing to migrate to this rural retreat. His sister had heard about what the doctors had told him and she told him that she knew him very well and she knew very well that he was not going to do what the doctors told him to do. He was preparing to migrate to this rural retreat. Migrate meaning leave one place and go to another. He was going to the countryside. Rural, countryside, retreat, a place where he could rest for a while and recover. Like I said, he had a problem with his nerves. He was a very nervous person, scared all the time. 
not calm and composed like the niece. So here in this room, we have two people who are totally opposite. We have a young girl who's 15 years old who has very strong nerves. And we have an older man, Mr. Frampton, whose nerves are bad. And the doctors have asked him to rest, to meet people, talk to people. The more you talk to people, the better you get. They told him to do that. But his sister said she could not believe he would do that. You will bury yourself down there and not speak to a living soul and your nerves will be worse than ever from moping. His sister told him that she knew him very well. He would go into that village, into that countryside and he would just sit in one place in his house and he would not speak to anyone. And then what would happen? He would just keep feeling more and more sad and dejected, moping meaning feeling hopeless, sad. He would keep feeling sad and his nerves would not improve. They would just get worse. So this is what she decided to do for him. I shall just give you letters of introduction to all the people I know there. She said she would write letters. She had been there to that place. She knew some of the people and she decided that she would write letters to those people and tell them that this was her brother. So she would give him those letters so that he could go visiting those total strangers and give the letters to them so that they would not be scared of talking to him. You know, they would warm up to him immediately because he really needed help. She continues to say, some of them, as far as I can remember, were quite nice. So she says, maybe there will be a lot of people who won't be very nice in that place, the place you're going to. But I can remember that some of them were quite nice. Frampton wondered whether Mrs. Sappleton, the lady to whom he was presenting one of the letters of introduction, came into the nice division. His sister had said earlier to him that there were a few people in that place who were nice. Now he began to wonder whether this Mrs. Sappleton, who he was visiting with one of the letters of recommendation, introduction rather, was a nice woman. He wasn't sure. Do you know many of the people around here? Asked the niece when she judged that they had had sufficient silent communion. So now the young lady who's 15 years old, who's calm and confident and composed, has decided to speak to him and ask him a very important question. And why is it a very important question? Because this question is going to start her on one of her naughty stories. Her plans are going to come into action if he answers this question the way she wants him to answer it. So her question is, do you know many of the people around here? She wants to know from him whether he knows many people or not. And when did she ask this question? She asked this question when she judged, when she decided that they had had sufficient silent communion. Communion meaning uh, a time when you share your thoughts and feelings intimately. So they had been silent with their own thoughts for a while. And the niece decided that that was enough time to be silent and think your own thoughts. So she came up to that question. Now let's see what his answer is. And she is waiting to hear that answer. Hardly a soul, said Frampton. So he hardly knows anyone. My sister was staying here at the rectory, you know. Rectory is a house that a church gives to a person. So his sister lived there four years ago. Some four years ago means not exactly four years ago, but approximately four years ago. And she gave me letters of introduction to some of the people here. So this poor young man, Mr. Frampton, does not suspect that this girl has any ulterior motives that she's gonna make up some stories to, you know, scare him or, he doesn't suspect her at all. She's a young girl, she's only 15 years old. They're innocent, aren't they? So he tells her, that he hardly knows anyone. 
And he also tells her that it was his sister who had given him letters of introduction to some of the people. And his sister had been there around four years ago. That was quite some time ago. He made the last statement in a tone of distinct regret. Distinct meaning it was very obvious and regret meaning he was sorry, he was sad about it. Sad about what? Which last statement? This one. She gave me letters of introduction to some of the people here. So he's actually very sad that his sister gave him those letters. If she had not given him those letters, he would have done what his sister thought he would do. You know, he would have stayed in his house, not met anyone and got worse. So now the young lady is getting very interested. He has already answered one question of hers, one very important one and told her that he hardly knows anyone. And now she's gonna ask him the next important question, very important question. Then you know practically nothing about my aunt? Pursued the self-possessed young lady. Pursued means asking another question. She couldn't just stay quiet after she asked one question. She had to ask the next question because things are getting interesting for her. So she asks him now, so you know practically nothing about my aunt? Self-possessed, I told you, means calm and confident. And how does he answer her? Again, he is unsuspecting. He does not suspect that this young girl is going to be wicked. So he tells her the truth. Only her name and address. He says, what do I know about your aunt? Nothing much. I only know her name and I know her address. That's all admitted the caller. Caller meaning the person who had called on them, the person who had come to visit them, the person who had informed that he would come. That's why caller. He was wondering whether Mrs. Sappleton was in the married or widowed state. See, he was not just a nervous kind of person. He was also the kind of person who would constantly think about things. His thoughts were going on and on and on in his little head. So now he's wondering whether Mrs. Sappleton is married or widowed. He knows that she is either married and has a husband or she has lost her husband, but she has been married. Definitely, she's not single. And how does he know this? An undefinable something about the room seemed to suggest masculine habitation undefinable something. There was something about that room where he was sitting. Undefinable because he could not quite decide what it was, but there was something which seemed to suggest, which implied masculine habitation, which told him that there was a man or men living in that house, habitation, living there. Masculine men, okay? Now the little girl has to continue, so she says. Her great tragedy happened just three years ago. Great tragedy, what tragedy? Tragedy meaning something very bad, something that has caused a lot of hurt and injury. Maybe not injury, but hurt, something that has upset her. Who is she talking about? She's talking about her aunt. So she's saying, oh, you know nothing about my aunt? I will tell you something about her before she comes down the stairs and sees me talking to you. Her great tragedy happened just three years ago. So the child said, you know, it happened three years ago. That would be since your sister's time. That means your sister was here four years ago, like you said. So your sister would actually not know what really happened to my aunt. Her tragedy, asked Frampton, somehow in this restful country spot, Tragedy seemed out of place. So Frampton is shocked. Her tragedy, he says. He can't believe that that lady would have had a tragedy in her life because this was such a restful country spot. That's why his doctors had sent him to live there. Something like a tragedy seemed out of place. It just seemed like it could not happen. An event that caused great suffering could not possibly happen in that beautiful place. You may wonder why we keep that window wide open on an October afternoon, said the niece, indicating a large French window that opened onto a lawn. 
there comes the French window. So the niece is saying, haven't you looked at that window and wondered why we keep it open on an October afternoon? And there she was pointing to a French window that opened out onto a lawn outside. What's a French window? I'll tell you. A French window is a large window with two rows of upright rectangular glass panes. Okay. So what does he reply? It is quite warm for the time of the year, said Frampton. But has that window got anything to do with the tragedy? So he tells the young lady, um, yeah, I agree with you that the window should not really be wide open on an October afternoon. It is quite warm. But uh, why are you talking about that window? Uh, has that window got anything to do with that tragedy, with that bad thing that happened to your aunt? Out through that window, three years ago to a day, her husband and her two young brothers went off for their day shooting. They never came back. In crossing the moor to their favorite snipe shooting ground, they were all three engulfed in a treacherous piece of bog. It had been that dreadful wet summer, you know, and places that were safe in other years gave way suddenly without warning. Their bodies were never recovered. That was the dreadful part of it. Here the child's voice lost its self-possessed note and became falteringly human. Poor aunt always thinks that they will come back someday. They and the little brown spaniel that was lost with them and walk in at that window just as they used to do. So let me explain this part to you. So the girl is telling the man, or the man has asked her, oh, why are you asking me about that window, that French window? Does that window have anything to do with your aunt's tragedy? So she replies by telling him the entire story. She says, out through that window, three years ago to a day, that means exactly three years ago today, this was the day it happened, exactly three years ago. Her husband and her two young brothers were off for the day shooting. So the young man had been quite right when he knew that there had been men living in that house. Remember? He knew that men had lived there. So she tells him her husband and two young brothers had gone off shooting. They never came back. In crossing the moor, do you know what a moor is? A moor is an uncultivated land mostly covered with heather. It's like soft land where you can sink into the ground and never come back. And why they had gone there? To their favorite snipe shooting ground. Snipe, a snipe is a bird. So they had gone shooting birds, a snipe shooting ground. Oh, I must tell you something about snipe shooting. It existed in North America sometime in the 1840s and it was a kind of prank actually that was played on someone when people took him hunting. They would tell him to hunt a snipe and it was a non-existent animal. They called a non-existent animal a snipe. But in this case, they had gone shooting a bird, birds called snipes. So they had gone to their favorite snipe shooting ground and all three were engulfed. They were covered in a treacherous piece of bog. Bog is wet, muddy ground that cannot support a heavy body. You know, you just sink. It's like sinking sand. You sink, you sink right in. You stand on it. There's no way you can save yourself. You just go deeper and deeper into it and cannot come out. It had been that dreadful, that horrible wet summer, you know, and places that were safe in other years gave way suddenly without warning. Look at her story. She says, places that were declared safe earlier 
in years before this. Suddenly were not safe anymore. Without warning, they just gave way. And the worst part was that their bodies were never recovered. No one could get their bodies out of there. Who would chance going there to try and get their bodies out? They wouldn't. That was the dreadful part of it. Here the child's voice lost its self-possessed note. Her confidence seemed to falter and she became falteringly human. Falteringly meaning she was like hesitating. She was unsteady and that was very human. You know, she was sad and she was um, acting like she was upset about it. Poor aunt always thinks that they will come back someday. They and the little brown spaniel that was lost with them. So she says it wasn't just her husband and her brothers who never came back. It was a little brown spaniel as well. A little small dog with a silky coat and drooping ears. And spaniels were actually used in those days to retrieve water birds that had been shot with arrows. So she said, you know, it was even that brown spaniel that was lost with them. And her aunt was waiting for them all to walk in at that window, just as they used to do. Like I said, you would really not suspect a 15 year old young lady or girl to be up to this kind of mischief. So he did not suspect it one bit. He believed every word of what she said. That is why the window is kept open every evening till it is quite dusk. Poor dear aunt. She has often told me how they went out. Her husband with his white waterproof coat over his arm and Ronnie, her youngest brother, singing, Birdie, why do you bound? Just as he always did to tease her because she said it got on her nerves. Do you know, sometimes on still quiet evenings like this, I almost get a creepy feeling that they will all walk in through that window. So what is she saying now? She says, yes, that is why the window is kept open every evening. Why? Because her aunt is secretly hoping that they will all come back, even though three years have passed. And she keeps the window open till it is quite dusk. That means way past sunset. It's quite dark. Poor dear aunt, she has often told me how they went out. Her husband with his white waterproof coat over his arm. So she's saying, you know, my aunt tells me the same story again and again. She tells me how her husband, my uncle, went out with a waterproof, a white waterproof coat over his arm. And her youngest brother, Ronnie, how he would always sing, Bertie, why do you bound? Just to tease her, because she always said that it got on her nerves. It made her mad. It irritated her. Do you know sometimes on still, quiet evenings like this? She said, you know, an evening like this, I almost get a creepy feeling that they will all walk in through that window. Now, this was a really naughty girl. Don't you agree? She knew very well that this poor young man's nerves were bad. He had been sent to this place to rest and recover and make his nerves strong. Then she made sure that she found out that he knew nothing about the place where he was in. He knew no one over there, hardly anyone, and he knew nothing about her aunt. And then she makes up this brilliant story to scare him. If it was you or me, maybe we would not have got scared. But a man like that, whose nerves are already bad, that's sad. She broke off with a little shudder. Now she's even shaking with fear, trembling. It was a relief to Frampton when the aunt bustled into the room with a whirl of apologies for being late in making her appearance. Now Frampton was so nervous, just watching this young lady telling her story that he was so relieved, he was so happy when the, the aunt bustled into the room, you know, came into the room fast, quickly, with a whirl of apologies. She had so many apologies. She was saying sorry all the time for keeping him waiting for so long. 
I hope Vera has been amusing you, she said. She asked him, well, I'm sorry I was late, but I hope my niece has been amusing you. I hope she's been talking to you and making you laugh and entertaining you. She has been very interesting, said Frampton. Well, he wouldn't quite use the word amusing because amusing means making someone laugh and entertaining them, but I don't think he would consider that amusing what the young lady did to him. Interesting, yes, but amusing, no. I hope you don't mind the open window, said Mrs. Sappleton briskly. She was talking fast. She said, I hope you don't mind the open window. My husband and brothers will be home directly from shooting and they always come in this way. They've been out for snipe in the marshes today, so they'll make a fine mess over my poor carpets. So like you menfolk, isn't it? Now she's explaining to him and getting him all worked up. She says, my husband and brothers will be home directly from shooting. You know, they've gone out shooting. So when they come home, they use this French window to come in. Why do they do that? Because they've been out in the marshes hunting snipe. And if they come in through the front door, they will make a fine mess, a big mess. They'll make the whole place dirty. They'll make my carpets very dirty. So I don't let them come in from there. I make them come in through the French windows. So like you men folk, isn't it? She says, all you men are the same, isn't it? You don't care that the house has been cleaned and we have to struggle to clean the house. You just dirty it whenever you feel like dirty it. You don't think about how to walk in and where to walk in. She rattled on cheerfully about the shooting and the scarcity of birds and the prospects for duck in the winter. She kept talking and talking and talking very happily about shooting, about how the birds were less, scarcity of birds, they were less, and the prospects for duck in the winter, how, how uh, possible it would be for them to find duck in winter. To Frampton, it was all purely horrible. He made a desperate but only partially successful effort to turn the talk on to a less ghastly topic. He was conscious that his hostess was giving him only a fragment of her attention and her eyes were constantly straying past him to the open window and the lawn beyond. It was certainly an unfortunate coincidence that he should have paid his visit on this tragic anniversary. So while the woman kept talking and talking and talking very happily, he was getting more and more upset. He made a desperate but only partially successful effort. Desperate means he was so desperate. He was trying very hard, but only partially successful effort. He tried very hard, but he was only very little, very partly successful to turn the talk to a less ghastly topic. For him, it was a ghastly topic. It was a horrible topic. He could not stand the topic, the topic of shooting. And you know why he couldn't stand it? He had heard a fantastic story from the niece. He couldn't bear to hear anything more about it. When the aunt had appeared in the room, he had been so happy that they were going to talk about different things. And now she's talking about the same thing again. Of course, in a different way, not knowing what he has heard. But now his mind is working over time. He already has a problem with his nerves, the poor man. He was conscious that his hostess was giving him only a fragment of her attention. She was barely paying attention to him, even though he was trying his best to talk to her. He wanted to change the topic and make her talk about something else, but she was not listening to him. Her eyes were constantly straying past him to the open window and the lawn beyond. She was not even looking at him properly. She was looking at the window, the open French window looking past the window onto the lawn as if she was expecting people to come, as if she was really expecting her husband and brothers and the little dog to come in. It was certainly an unfortunate coincidence. Now Mr. Frampton says, oh my God, why would I have visited them on a day like this to pay a visit to her on this tragic anniversary, on this particular day, this exact day when the tragedy took place in her life? It was really bad luck for him to have come on this day. 
The doctors agree on ordering me complete rest, an absence of mental excitement, and avoidance of anything in the nature of violent physical exercise, announced Frampton, who labored under the tolerably widespread delusion that total strangers and chance acquaintances are hungry for the least detail of one's ailments and infirmities, their cause and cure. So what is he saying? He's trying his best to distract the aunt. He's telling her about his ailments, about his illnesses. The doctors agree in ordering me complete rest. He said, the doctors have asked me to rest completely and have an absence of mental excitement. I should not get excited mentally and avoidance of anything in the nature of violent physical exercise. I should not get violent. I should not do anything physically violent, any exercise that is violent announced Frampton, who labored under the tolerably widespread delusion. He labored, meaning he had this false notion, delusion meaning a belief that exists even when there's proof against it. So he had this delusion, tolerably widespread delusion, tolerably widespread. Everyone, you know, mostly thought the same way. And what did they think? They thought what he thought. And what was it they all thought? They thought that strangers are hungry for the least detail of one's ailments and infirmities. That strangers want to know all about your illness and all about your physical and mental weakness. Infirmities means physical and mental weakness and their cause and cure. So he decided he would just tell her everything about his illness. On the matter of diet, they are not so much in agreement, he continued. So while he told the aunt everything about his illness, he's saying the doctors all agree that I should not have any kind of mental excitement and I should be very calm and composed and have complete rest. But they don't agree on the matter of diet. All the doctors have told me different things about what I should eat and what I shouldn't eat. On the matter of diet, they are not so much in agreement. They don't agree so much. No, said Mrs. Sappleton, in a voice which only replaced a yawn at the last moment. So poor Mrs. Sappleton is so bored with the story that she is trying to say something and says no. And no is replacing a yawn. Then she suddenly brightened into alert attention. So she was so bored with what he was saying to her. And then suddenly she brightens, her eyes become bright. She becomes alert, she's attentive. But not to what Frampton was saying, oh no. Not about his illnesses and what the doctors told him. Here they are at last, she cried, just in time for tea. And don't they look as if they were muddy up to the eyes? Now she is delighted because her husband and brothers are back. And they are back just in time for tea. And she says, look, look, look at them. Aren't they muddy up to the eyes? Aren't they like full of mud right up to their eyes? Frampton shivered slightly and turned towards the niece with a look intended to convey sympathetic comprehension. He shivered and he turned towards the niece. He thought he would look at her and she would look at him and their looks would convey sympathetic comprehension. You know, they would look at each other and they would act like they understood what she was saying, what the aunt was saying, and they would sympathize with what she was saying. They would sympathize with what she was feeling. But the child did not look back at him. The child was staring out through the open window with a dazed horror in her eyes. Now, not only was she good at telling these horrible stories, she was a very good actress too. She knew he would look at her. So she did not look at him. She looked out through the window and she made sure that her face looked terrified. That she looked like she was dazed and she had horror that she had seen something horrible causing fear in the chill shock of nameless fear nameless meaning the fear that has no name we don't know what fear he had he was chilled he was he was shocked 
in the chill shock of nameless fear, Frampton swung around in his seat and looked in the same direction. He saw the niece looking out of the window like that, dazed with horror in her eyes. So he swung around in his chair quickly and looked in the same direction. And what do you think he saw? Did he see men walking towards the house with their dog? Of course he did. But he saw that because they were actually there. They were walking towards the house. That's what they did every evening. But in his mind, what he was seeing were ghosts. In the deepening twilight, just after sunset, three figures were walking across the lawn towards the window. They all carried guns under their arms and one of them was additionally burdened with a white coat hung over her shoulders. Additionally burdened, meaning he had something heavy to carry, an additional thing, which was a white coat hung over her shoulders, just the way the niece had described him. A tired brown spaniel kept close at their heels and that brown dog was there as well. Noiselessly, they neared the house. Why noiselessly? There was lawn there, but he didn't think of it that way, did he? And then a hoarse, young voice chanted out of the dusk. I said, Bertie, why do you bound? Does it remind you of the story that the niece told? It does, doesn't it? Frampton could not bear it any longer. Frampton grabbed widely at his stick and hat. The hall door, the gravel drive and the front gate were dimly noted stages in his headlong retreat. Meaning? He grabbed his stick and hat wildly. He didn't even look at them. He just grabbed them. And then all he could see was the hall door in front of him. He knew he needed to reach there. And after he reached the hall door, he knew he needed to reach the gravel drive. And after he reached the driveway, the gravel drive made the driveway made of gravel stones. He knew he had to reach the front gate next. They were just dimly noted stages in his headlong retreat. Poor man. Retreat meaning he had to get out of there. He had to leave immediately. Headlong meaning he did not think. He just could not think of what he was doing. He just had to do it. And he could not even see these things very clearly. It was dim, dimly noted. But he knew in his mind he had to do these three things. Reach the hall door, reach the drive, and reach the front gate to save himself. A cyclist coming along the road had to run into the hedge to avoid imminent collision. How sad is that? There was a man coming by on a cycle, a cyclist. And what he had to do? He had to go into the hedge. What's a hedge? A hedge is a boundary made of bushes and shrubs. Imminent meaning about to happen. It was bound to happen and collision is a clash. So the cyclist had to avoid that clash because Mr. Frampton was wildly running across there. He had to go into the hedge and fall. Here we are, my dear, said the bearer of the white Macintosh. Macintosh is a raincoat coming in through the window, fairly muddy, but most of it's dry. Who was that who bolted out as we came up? I said, who was that who ran out just as we came in? A most extraordinary man, a Mr. Nuttle, said Mrs. Sappleton, could only talk about his illnesses and dashed off without a word of goodbye or apology when you arrived. One would think he had seen a ghost. Well, we know that he actually thought he had seen a ghost, don't we? So they're asking her, who is that man? She said, I really don't know. He was a very strange man. He was Mr. Nuttle. And he only sat here and spoke about his illnesses. And then she suddenly got up and dashed off without even saying sorry or goodbye when you arrived. He acted like he had seen a ghost. I expect it was the Spaniel, said the niece calmly. Now we know the niece very well by now, don't we? So we know that she is full of these wonderful stories. So she explains to them, oh no, I don't think he ran because he thought you were ghosts. I expect it was the Spaniel. She said very calmly, I think he ran because he saw the dog. He told me he had a horror of dogs. 
He was once hunted into a cemetery somewhere on the banks of the Ganges by a pack of barrier dogs and had to spend the night in a newly dug grave with the creatures snarling and grinning and foaming just about, above him, enough to make anyone lose their nerve. Look at what the girl tells them. No, 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 he's scared of the spaniel because he told me before my aunt walked into the room, he mentioned that he was actually very scared of dogs. And why? Because he had experienced something very bad. He was once hunted into a cemetery, a graveyard, somewhere on the banks of the Ganga, the Ganges, by a pack of barrier dogs. Stray dogs had chased him, hunted him down into a cemetery. And then there was a newly dug grave there in that cemetery. And they had hunted him down and pushed him practically into that grave. He had fallen into that grave and they stood on top there of the grave. And what were they doing? Looking at him and snarling and grinning and foaming, you know, with saliva dropping from their mouths, like waiting to eat him up. And that had made him lose his nerve. He was, because of that incident, he's very scared of dogs. So he must have seen the spaniel and run for his life. Romance at short notice was her specialty. What do we mean by that? At short notice, without, without warning, without enough time, she could make up stories without warning. She was very creative. She had a great imagination. And because of her, that poor young man would probably never go and visit another person while he lived over there. Thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed the story, you can watch another enjoyable story by clicking on this link. Here's what Carl Jung says about having an active imagination, like the girl in the story. He says that it bridges the gap between the conscious and unconscious mind. It is this play with fantasy that gives rise to creative work. So go ahead and be creative. Use your imagination. I'll say bye for now. I'll see you soon.